The top 500 uh, has been running since 1993, uh, ranking the supercomputers according to how well they do on one particular computation, which is solving a dense linear algebra system. Uh, and what I plotted here is a core count uh, of the leading machine every six months. And I find it interesting because clearly uh, you see that strange things happened uh, at the beginning, 93, 94, 95, numbers going up and down. Something strange happened in 2003, 2004. The core count started, had been stable for a long period of time, then climbed. And something strange is happening now, uh, you know, with core counts going up and down. So let's try to understand this uh, punctuated equilibrium, if you wish, or what's up and down, what's coming and then going. And let's start with this story, long forgotten history for most of you, not for some of the people on this, <laughs> on this table. Uh, the first big extinction in supercomputers, supercomputing, uh, was in 1990 or something. Uh, what was called the attack of the kilomicros at the time. When we moved to gray machines, to machines like this, which was a thinking machine. What was the difference? The difference is that these were uh, vector machines built out of uh, bipolar technology, and I'm not going to go into the details of what's the difference between bipolar and MOS, but the main point is that bipolar was a very hot technology. Hot, not in the sense of cool, but in the sense of generating a lot of, of, uh, of the energy, generating a lot of heat. So it was hard to cool them. And the latest models were using liquid nitrogen to succeed in cooling the, the power that was generated by these machines. Uh, so energy consumption became a major roadblock uh, uh, on the other hand, uh, Intel was already a successful company, fast growing. Most technology was around. It was not consuming as much power. It did not require aggressive uh, cooling. You could use uh, fans to cool it. Uh, it was growing fast in the, in the markets that were using it. Uh, Intel was growing very fast. It was used in controllers, in workstations. In PCs, by that time, 82, I think, is when the PC came out. It had, it started in the early 70s, so most had 20 year uh, history, and it was clear that it was going on an exponential curve, what's called Moore's Law, uh, which I'm going to repeat later. Uh, but it's interesting that with all that, when uh, the machines, sh when we shifted from uh, bipolar gray supercomputers to this kind of machine, actually the new machines were inferior to the old machine. It was not a case of moving to a better technology. It was a case of moving to much cheaper technology and perhaps a more promising technology. For those of you that have read uh, Christensen's Innovator's Dilemma, that would be a well-recognized uh, phenomenon for those of you that have not, maybe you should read it. But his point is that uh, 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 good technology is chased by good enough technology. Not technology which is better, but technology that's good enough and much cheaper. And that was exactly what happened here. CMOS was not better than bipolar, but it was good enough and significantly cheaper. Uh, since then, we have continued on this curve of Moore's law. What is Moore's law? Moore's law tells us uh, that uh, we double roughly the number of transistors. Well, sometimes you read every two years, sometimes you read every three years, so it's not exactly a law. Things like, you know, go up and down, but between two and three years, we double the number of transistors on the chip, and you see uh, the, the curve. And uh, what's more important is what has been called Denar scaling. Denar uh, is a scientist at IBM Research, 
that published these uh, uh, rules, I don't know, it was probably 70s or something. Uh, when I learned VLSI design, uh, that was we learned, you know, you decrease uh, the size of your feature by some factor, by factor lambda. Uh, you can decrease uh, the voltage by the same factor lambda. That means that you have uh, lambda square as many transistors on your chip because it's an area. It also means that you can increase the clock speed by a factor of lambda and the power consumption of your chip has not changed. And that's most important. So we could continuously draw the density of our uh, chips higher and higher. We could continuously increase the clock uh, uh, rate higher and higher without increasing the cons power consumption of chips. Uh, it was not really exactly what happened because chip manufacturers are greedy. So they pushed power consumption higher than uh, by uh, uh, push the clock rate higher than by this than this rule would say, and they put, therefore the power consumption go uh, went higher uh, or increased over time. But it was roughly what drove the IT industry for two decades. And, and uh, yeah, there is this law: if something cannot go forever, it must stop. It will stop, and uh, the null scaling has stopped. It cannot go forever. Eventually, you go to a single atom transistor that doesn't work very well. Uh, in fact, it has stopped a long time ago. It has stopped when we were around 130 nanometer in the early decade. And basically, what has happened is that the null uh, scaling speaks about dynamic power what you consume when uh, you uh, switch a switch back and forth between a zero and a one, it didn't speak about static power, uh, current that leaks uh, across your switches or, or to the substrate. And leakage current become increasingly large. Leakage current increases when the device size shrinks. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, we cannot anymore uh, increase the clock uh, cycle. Uh, we cannot increase anymore the clock cycle. We continue to increase the density of our, of our circuits, but uh, uh, clock, in fact, has gone down in the last, uh, uh, whatever, 10 years or so slowly, but it's going down rather than up. Uh, and in a sense, it's the same problem we had uh, with bipolar. 20-something uh, years ago. That's a citation from the ITIA, the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors. While power consumption is an urgent challenge, its leakage or static component will become a major industry crisis in the long term, threatening the survival of CMOS technology itself, just as bipolar technology was threatened and eventually disposed of decades ago. So in a sense, well, it's the same crisis that we were uh, in the 90s when we shifted technology. Uh, so is it so? Uh, history repeats itself in some sense because we have the power wall that now CMOS has hit before bipolar has hit, clock speed is not raising. At the time, there was a hope that one can continue with bipolar by moving shifting materials, people started working on gallium arsenide, and gallium arsenide was not exactly ready for, for deployment. Gallium arsenide is still not ready for use in major uh, computer in, uh, usages. So people speak of new materials, you hear about nanotubes, nanowires, what have you. All those are promising technologies that are just not ready. Uh, on the other hand, we are in a much different situation uh, you know, IT industry has grown significantly since the uh, 90s, uh, so there is much more uh, interest in finding a replacement technology to CMOS and much more ability to invest in such replacement technology. One worrisome difference is at the time that bipolar died, uh, MOS was very much an existing technology. 
uh, good enough technology. We don't have today a replacement technology for CMOS, which is ready, which is already used in, uh, you know, deployed in a uh, uh, significant way. And the other aspect, when we moved to bipolar to CMOS, we also moved from vector machines to clusters of PCs or cluster of workstations. That was a very different programming model from vector code to message passing code, uh, which people did with major effort, but now there are probably 10 times as much software that needs to be moved. We have grown, so the difficulty of moving to a new programming model is much higher than it was at the time. Some estimates the number of uh, lines of code that are running on supercomputers at around 200 million. It's not trivial to port all this code to a new model. So where we are, uh, one thing is very clear, transistor size cannot shrink forever. Uh, you know, it's hard to build a transistor with, few than, uh, with less than a few hundred atoms. Uh, people speak at five nanometer as a kind of limit of CMOS. Five nanometer uh, is roughly 20 silicon atoms on the side. So when you speak of five nanometers, there is no much m matter in the transistor or in the gate of the, you know, that uh, is supposed to. Uh, so we're working to 3D, so moving to 3D transistors, that's fine, but it's only one more dimension. You still have this limitation of how far you can go down. And in fact, Today, when, you know, in the past, uh, you expected that if you have twice as many circuits on your chip, you can get twice as much performance in a sense. That's not true anymore. That's not true anymore because uh, uh, feature size is not anymore an accurate measure. It's true that you uh, decrease the size of your wires, but maybe you need to have them thicker because you have more uncertainty on the exact profile. Maybe you need to increase the distance between them so that they don't interfere with each other. So there are various problems that uh, implies that the gain from shrinking the feature size is not as large as it was in the past. You need new materials, you need, uh, as we said, so uh, technology becomes more complex and more expensive. Uh, that is a big obstacle. Uh, strangely enough, we are designing circuits which are 14, 22 nanometer or 14 nanometer on the size, and we are using for that light sources which are 192 nanometer. Since I am not a physicist, I can never understand that. But we, we are etching features which are one tenth, less than one tenth, the size of the wavelengths that we are using for etching, and it seems that we cannot continue doing that. So we need to s switch to to uh, uh, lower wavelengths, high ultraviolet, which is a huge expense. That's uh, uh, a list of items which are. Uh, resolved or we know the solution and we need to, to uh, just deploy it or we don't know the solution red uh, as we go down uh, feature size and you see that the old blocks keep amassing and it's not clear if we can solve all of them. And then there, are, there is money, always things are determined by money. Uh, and the point, the interesting fact, uh, the cost, uh, uh, per transistor, the cost of a chip uh, per transistor has not grown, gone down in 2013. And that was the first time since, since ever. And, and what drives the industry is not building faster machine. What drives the industry is getting the same performance at a lower cost or getting more performance at the same cost. If we need to uh, uh, pay more in order to get more performance, there is little incentive to continue to push technology. So that's a problem. And there are multiple reasons why it's happening. Uh, FAPs are becoming more expensive. It's an investment of $10 billion or more to, to build a new FAP to, to manufacture these chips. In fact, there are predictions that only two manufacturers will be able to go below 22 nanometer because it's too expensive. And you keep hearing about IBM going out of the business of uh, building chips. And the expectation is that the number, you know, we will be left with two and then one and then zero. Cost of manufacturing per chip keep increasing. The fact that you need more 
uh, the fact that you need, uh, you know, more masks, you need more layers, you need uh, uh, more materials, and so on. And there's a point, uh, for 20 or 30 years, the IC industry, the, inter the chip industry, has grown much faster than overall economy. And we all benefit from that, that IT has grown much faster than the overall economy, but we know it cannot go forever. So at some point, the growth has to slow, and at which point it becomes harder to, to support the large investment that's needed for getting high performance. The other point to keep in mind is that uh, where all the chip manufacturers are focused today is the portable, the mobile, because that's where the big markets are. Uh, chips for your cell phone, not chips for supercomputers. And you can ask, can we build a supercomputer from cell phone chips? And there are interesting uh, uh, attempts to use mobile technology. It has one obvious advantage. It's focused on low power. And power consumption is today a major obstacle when you look at supercomputing. So low power technology is nice. Uh, the mobile technology is focused on system on a chip, putting more and more components on one chip, and that's good for supercomputing. You will have your CPU and some memory and some network interface all in one chip, very compact, very good, fast communication. Uh, they are focused on small systems, you know. It's a system on a chip, but it's a one chip system, which we want tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of chips. They are uh, focused on integrating analog, uh, you know, the GPS, the radio, whatever in the same chip. Doesn't interest us MEMS, your, uh, uh, your gyroscope, or things of that kind. We are not interested. Uh, uh, if your phone fails once a year, that's perfect. But if we connect together uh, 10,000 phones, we start having a problem. Uh, and probably phone industry is not terribly interested in 64-bit floating point uh, performance. So let's discuss the future. And before I go to the future, uh, I don't know if I say it, but I should have said this jump here was when uh, uh, clock uh, rates stopped going up. So we moved from single core chips to multi-core chips because the only way of using the density, increased density, was to put more cores. So you see the core uh, jump. And here is uh, the accelerator revolution, where you start having systems with uh, GPUs and now with Intel Phi. And I assume it's, people are not sure exactly how to count the number of cores on a GPU, so the numbers go up and down. But let's speak about, <laughs> let's speak about that point here. What does it mean? And what are the possible ways of continuing to push performance, assuming that chip performance stops increasing as fast as it has in the past? If it starts plateauing, what can we do? Well, one thing we can do is try to put many chips together, very closely together. Uh, so we get more chips in the same volume. More importantly, we decrease communication. And as I'm going to discuss, uh, in a little bit, communication is a major obstacle to performance and to power, and a major source of power consumption in, CP, in uh, supercomputers. So getting something that denser and re reduce communication is important. By the way, to make this argument, uh, that's a chart I picked from Peter Kogi, uh, where he analyzed how much energy is spent doing one flop uh, when it does an LU decomposition. And that's using some assumption on uh, technology in 2015. The point is that doing a floating point multiply in the technology he looked at takes 10 picojoules. But when you look at the overall consumption, it takes you close to 500 picojoule per floating point multiply. And the other 465 are what it takes you to go to memory, to go to caches, to do everything but the floating point operation. So the point is that energy is not going in doing floating point operation, it's going in everything else. And if we can reduce everything else, we're in a good shape. And that's one example of tight packaging 
which is developed by Micron. Uh, it's a 3D memory stack, HMC. Uh, basically, they're putting many DRAM chips, uh, one above another, and the controller below. And uh, as you see, it's wonderful. It takes much less space, much less energy, uh, much less power, and many fewer signals that you have on a regular, uh, you know, DIMM type solution, DDR3 or DDR4. So that's one example, and surely we shall have more of those. Of course, there are two problems. One is cooling. Uh, memory, we can probably resolve it, but if you start stacking CPUs together, you have a problem with cooling. Okay, we shall go back to liquid nitrogen. Uh, and the other is uh, serviceability. Now, if something goes bad, you have to replace the entire stack. You cannot replace, uh, you know, one DIMM or something. Uh, in fact, when I was at IBM, we were one concept we had at the time was to build a 3D supercomputer, which will be all immersed. And it means that if you were to service something, you take an a skewer, basically, a kebab, you know, all the systems on one column, which is wonderful, you know, in terms of design, but the engineers were not too happy. Uh, doing it back, back better, that's what I call frictionless, frictionless architecture. If you look, for example, and that's again from Kogi, what happens when you, when you try to do a load? And what happens is plenty of things. You know, you go to, to a TLB, you, you uh, uh, search in a cache, and you search uh, four locations in your L1, and if you miss, you search 12 locations in your L2, and if you miss, you go to the L3, and then you go to all the other caches in the system. And when you try to bring one word to memory, you end up accessing something like 17 uh, different memory locations just to know that you have to go to memory that probably you knew algorithmically, but the system doesn't know it. So can you build architectures which are much more efficient in uh, avoiding this kind of friction? And the other is that, yes, there is research in this area. Uh, one example, of course, is our GPUs. Basically, they reduce overhead of instruction decoding because same instruction applies to many, many uh, data much data, and they avoid the overhead of allocating registers and doing a variety of stuff you have to do because the resource management is much simpler. Uh, I think we need to work seriously on memory accelerators. In a sense, people have been discussing replacing scratch pad, uh, caches with scratch pads being, that are managed by software. That would be a simple example of a memory accelerator. But I think there is a lot of interesting work to do there. Uh, another interesting direction is approximate computing. Gee, do you always need 64-bit? Can you work with 32-bit or can you work with 64-bit but tolerate once in a while a mistake? And there is interesting work in this area of how we could use. And that can reduce the amount of hardware we are using or the power consumption by a lot. And finally, if you want the, uh, you know, save the most, you go to uh, application-specific systems. One good example is the Anton machines that's used for molecular dynamics, much more efficient in terms of power usage. In the past, application-specific machines were not uh, that uh, uh, successful uh, because by the time you design your machine, Intel has had three new generations of CPUs and you are behind. But if technology doesn't allow Intel to move its performance that fast, then building specialized machine becomes more uh, practical. The other is to look at what new device technology can give us. Give us. Uh, so one example is work on adiabatic computing or reversible computing. The point is that you can build gates uh, which consume very little energy uh, if you avoid the gate really, in a sense, changing state. Or, Rather than going from a zero to one, you go, you just move where the charges are on the gate, which is more complex. And uh, the interesting point is that the theoretical limit is ln2 kt, kt, I don't remember exactly, 10 to minus 23 joules or something like that, uh, 
current CMOS uses 100,000, is at 100,000 uh, above this theoretical limit. People have built uh, devices that can be very close to the theoretical limit, but they've built one such device. You know, from one such device to a computer, there is some number of years of development needed. Uh, another example, interesting example, there is a company that is trying to make, uh, to produce an optical computer. The point is that optics can be built so as to do FFT transforms or can be built so as to do matrix multiplication. So you could accelerate these kind of operations by an analog optical, com optical computer. Of course, the problem is it's not your entire computation. You still have to do I.O., you still have to do other parts of your algorithm. So it has to be a hybrid uh, solution. And the problem is always, you know, do you accelerate a large enough part of your computer and what's the cost of moving from the analog to digital and back? Another example uh, in which IARPA is investing a lot today is cryogenic computing, really. Uh, using Josephson junctions or rapi rapid single flux quantum logic. And I'm not a physicist, so don't ask me exactly how it works. Uh, by the way, the technology we need here of Josephson junction is also needed for, for uh, adiabatic computing. So uh, getting there requires getting here first. Uh, uh, and I picked one random slide on this. The point is that there is a research program funded by IARPA on this, but it's still at the level of producing devices, and we're still discussing to, be, to have devices uh, that could run at 10 gigahertz, um, and, and I shall s provide more information in the next slide, but we're still far from you know, having something that can replace a, today, or even at the end of the decade, uh, current supercomputers. The advantage of this technology is basically that it consumes much less energy, and you can propagate signals very quickly with very little, uh, you know, you can run it much faster and consume much less energy. Storage, by the way, in this technology is just uh, current flowing through a superconducting circuit, so it doesn't consume much energy. What's interesting is that when you think of this technology, uh, balance changes totally. Uh, I told you that communication is expensive. If you use superconducting technology, communication is very cheap. It's moving current on a superconducting wire, which is very cheap. In fact, communication of chip is still very cheap because it's still the same superconducting wire. Uh, logic is expensive, relatively. You know, just moving data is very cheap. Computing, especially floating point, is expensive. The other point is that we're still far in terms of the size of the, uh, of the devices. People speak of being in uh, 190 something uh, micron, uh, nanometers, sorry, in uh, 2019. So if we are to build computers out of this technology, we will need much uh, larger amount of chips uh, than we are using CMOS. <laughs> and most uh, importantly, you know, uh, you won't have cryogenic cell phones, so it's not going to be driven by, by uh, or it's unlikely to be driven for a long while by commodity technology. Uh, today, uh, there are few small companies working on cryogenic uh, technology, and it's used only on very special purpose devices. Then we have uh, totally different ideas, quantum computing. I'm not going to say anything about quantum computing. I'm not going to say anything about neuromorphic computing, which is another idea which is being pushed. Uh, you know, brain-like circuits, biocomputing, recombine DNA and get some computation to happen. Uh, to happen, the only thing I shall say about this technology is that nobody has figured out how they solve PDEs or how they do simulations. <laughs> So very interesting, but not for the applications that you heard discussed here. So let me finish. Exascale is going to happen. That I think the current official date, I don't remember. <laughs> Keeps shifting once in a while, but it seems by now fairly uh, uh, solid. Uh, 
it's becoming increasingly hard to continue business as usual. Many of us expect that the extra scale will have difficulty happening. It seems to be happened without too much violence to, to the technology, uh, uh, but, uh, but it's becoming increasingly harder. In fact, supercomputers are already becoming special purpose. Uh, I would expect within four or five years, all or almost all very large supercomputers to use chips which are not for the PC chips or phone chips or what have you, but chips which are specialized for high-end scientific computing. Uh, you know, using GPUs or using other type of accelerators, fee type machines coming from Intel. So we already go to more specialized hardware. And how much that will continue uh, is interesting. I don't believe that supercomputing story ends with exascale. We should start speaking of zeta scale. Uh, but I know uh, that uh, Zscale machine will not be a cluster of PC or a cluster of commodity chips. We will need to think of supercomputers as really unique machines built out of fairly unique technologies, like some of those that I've shown as showing promise. So it's going to be very interesting, right? Thank you. And that's, by the way, why Illinois is good in supercomputing or parallel computing. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for Mark? Um, yeah, you, so you talked about uh, how the IC field has hit a wall or everything, but I can't help but wonder, has the software side, like the application and everything, have them? Uh, caught up with the development on the hardware side? There is also a lot to be gained on the software side. Uh, as long as technology moved fast in terms of performance, uh, clearly we were not that worried in the general world about performance. It was more important to be able to develop software fast. So we got these very layered systems, you know, of uh, programming language, interpreter, compiler, uh, operating system, runtime, what have you. And there is a lot of efficiency lost in these many levels of translation. So there is work, but then there is a trade-off. If you try to program closer to the hardware, of course it's harder than trying to program. So it's the example of caches, you know, that I brought is a software and hardware example. Having caches make programming much easier, but it consumes a lot of energy. If you have now to, to be responsible for moving data, programming becomes harder, but you get a much more efficient algorithm. So everything that I presented is really a hardware software story. And uh, if we uh, have to push performance, we will need also to work on, on the software story. And uh, we have not developed a programming environment, programming tools that is really focused on performance. We are using general purpose environments which are, uh, you know, which are developed for programmers doing whatever web programming uh, and with Ruby on Rails and we have not developed that much, uh, you know, good environments f for people that really care about performance. Yes. Uh, so, if you believe that the supercomputers will become more um, specialized, like exascale, uh, would that not mean that there will become uh, fewer uh, supercomputers? Uh, good question. Uh, you know, in a sense, we could build today an exascale machine. You know, just spend uh, uh, whatever a billion dollar and uh, be willing to spend uh, one hundred million dollar on your energy bill, on your power bill every every year. Uh, so the question, uh, as long as this uh, uh, relentless advance of commodity technology happened, people didn't ask the hard question, how much it is worth to invest to get a, you know, an exascale or a zeta scale or whatever supercomputer. Uh, if it becomes harder, more expensive, more unique, you start having the same question you ask about particle accelerator or any big facility you know, why it is important to science. I think we can make the argument that supercomputers, uh, you know, are very important in many uh, branches of science and engineering. Uh, we have made this argument, but we never felt compelled to push it as hard as, say, uh, astronomers that ask for billion dollar telescopes or uh, 
phys particle physicists that ask for $10 billion or $100 billion. I don't know what's now. Well, $10 billion, let's say, accelerator. Incidentally, uh, ITER, uh, which is a fusion experiment in France, is supposed to consume something like 300, uh, more than 300 megawatt. And we keep debating whether a supercomputer should spend, you know, should consume 20 or 30 megawatt. So, you know, it's also a question of how big you are willing to think and are you willing to push your argument. Yeah. And meters cost would be something like 20 or more billion dollars. Yeah. So, and, and I think we can make a very plausible argument that increasing performance of supercomputers by a factor of 1,000, say, is worth as much money as ITER. But we have not been in the situation where we had to make this argument in the past. So uh, it sounds to me as if you believe that the, the new technologies are far enough away from being ready to build big machines for science that the punctuated equilibrium will continue. Perhaps once we get exascale, it'll be yeah, we shall go more slowly. Considerable flattening out for a decade or more, probably yeah. more than. A well, it depends. Again, all of that comes down to money, how much you invest into possible replacement technology uh, and how. Uh, so, yes, we may have five to ten years where progress is very slow. So, in one way, uh, perversely, that could be good for the software. It could be good. Uh, it could be good for computer science in general, you know. We, uh, it's good to have hard problems. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions about our future? <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you.